Welcome back. In today's video, we're going to be talking about bipolar disorder. See, many of you have asked me to make a video specifically about some medications that are used to treat bipolar disorder. So I thought it best to first review bipolar disorder so that way you can better understand how those medications work in treating bipolar disorder. So in this video, we're going to define bipolar disorder. We're going to differentiate between a manic and hypomanic episode. We're also going to look at the three main types of bipolar disorder, the causes and factors related to bipolar disorder, and then do a brief overview of the treatments that are used for bipolar disorder. So without further ado, here we go. Starting with number one, what is bipolar disorder? Well, bipolar disorder is a disorder that's defined by either a manic or hypomanic episode that fluctuates between a major depressive episode or a euthymic mood or normal mood. So what is a manic episode? Well, a manic episode is a distinct period of time, at least one week in length, that is a persistent elevated mood that is expansive or it could be very, very irritable during this period of time. This person will also have increased goal-directed activities or high energy. And they must also have at least three of the following symptoms or if the mood is only irritable, at least four of the following symptoms. First one being grandiosity. So they have an inflated self-esteem and this may get to a point where they can become delusional, where they think that they're God, they have special powers and they are unstoppable and things like that. The next one is a decreased need for sleep. You see, they're only getting like three to four hours of sleep at best and they don't even miss it. They feel very energized. They feel like they're on top of the world. They don't need sleep so they just keep going. They may also be very talkative or have what's called pressured speech, where they just keep going on and 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 talking in conversations. They'll butt into conversations and they just talk very, very, very fast. And you're just like, slow down. I can't even understand what you're saying. <laughs> also, they may also have what's called flight of ideas or these racing thoughts. And it's like one thing comes after another, after another, after another. And this flight of ideas can also be seen in their speech as they're talking about one topic and they move to another topic and they move to another because their thoughts are racing so fast they can't keep up with them. The next symptom that could occur is being easily distracted. So not only could they be distracted by their racing thoughts, that's very distracting in and of itself, but they'll also be distracted by other things, no sounds, birds flying. You know, if they're outside talking to you, they're very distracted by the environment, other people walking by, and they may also include that in the conversation where they're talking to you about one thing and they say, hey, did you see this person? And then, oh, and that bird over there, that was so pretty. And they'll just keep going on and on and on. And the next symptom is increase in goal-directed activity, which we mentioned is one of the primary factors required for a manic episode. But they could also have what's called psychomotor agitation where they're just so restless in their body, they have to keep going and going and going. And a lot of times patients with bipolar that are in a manic episode will say that they feel like electricity is just running through them and they have this energy and they just can't stop going. They're like the Energizer Bunny. They keep going and going and going and they'll direct this energy into projects. They'll start a business that they have no knowledge about and they'll even spend a lot of their money or all of their money in a bad investment on this goal-directed activity or project, which can lead to this next symptom which is getting engaged in risky behaviors. These risky behaviors could be bad investments, gambling, throwing away all of your hard earned money. It could even mean substance abuse and promiscuous uh, behaviors, which if you're married and you have a manic episode, this could mean 
being unfaithful to your partner. And so that is where the bipolar manic episode can really lead to social impairments and impairment in life and work. And that is one of the key symptoms or key features of a manic episode is that it will impair social and work function. The next thing is, is that it cannot be a result of a substance or a medication. It has to be independent of that and happen independent of drug use or a medication. And so what is a hypomanic episode? A hypomanic episode is considered a mild form of a mania or manic episode because it's the exact same criteria as the manic episode, except this episode will only last for like four to six days. It can't last a week because then it will be defined as a manic episode. So it's only going to last four to six days. It also won't cause that market impairment in social and work function. So these people can still go to work and a lot of times they actually function very well in the hypomanic state. And so a lot of times they don't like to get treatment because they'll miss their hypomanic states because they become more goal directed and driven and focused. Also, the hypomanic episode is not so severe that it requires hospitalization and it cannot include any psychosis or delusions. With a manic episode, you can have a grandiose symptom that can become delusional, but there can also be psychotic features of a manic episode. With a hypomanic episode, if there are psychotic features within a hypomanic episode, that will automatically constitute a manic episode. Also, if they require hospitalization, that again constitutes automatically a manic episode. Now with the hypomanic episode, though they may be able to function at work and their relationships may be maintained, the change or the hypomanic symptoms will be noticed by others. So family members and friends will notice that they're acting a little different. They're talking a little faster. They have a little bit more energy. They're doing those increased goal directed activities. They may be engaged in a couple of risky things that they normally wouldn't do and other people are starting to notice. And also this change in functioning is not characteristic of the person. It's not part of like their personality or what they would normally do. And so that is another reason why it's noticed by other people because it's uncharacteristic of that person. Okay, so now we know manic episode and hypomanic episode. Let's talk about the three main types of bipolar. Starting with number one, bipolar one disorder, which is also known as manic depressive disorder. Bipolar one disorder has to meet the criteria for the manic episode, which we just covered, and may be preceded or followed by either a hypomanic episode or a depressive episode. Now, though very uncommon, what may happen is that they only have manic episodes. So if someone is only having manic episodes and fluctuating from mania to euthymia or these normal periods, that would still be considered bipolar one, but that is very uncommon. Now the manic episode cannot be better explained by other disorders such as schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder or any type of delusional or psychotic disorder. Also keep in mind with bipolar disorder that they have a high risk of suicide. So a lot of times when they go into their depression, they become suicidal. And when they come out of their depression and they get a little bit of energy and start going into their manic episodes, they may actually have the energy and drive to follow through with the suicide. So bipolar disorder is considered a very severe mental illness. Overall, the suicide rate with bipolar is 10 to 30 times higher than the general population. Now, when we're looking at bipolar two, bipolar two requires both the major depressive disorder criteria and hypomania. So unlike bipolar one, where you can just have mania as the symptom and be diagnosed as bipolar one, in bipolar two, you have to not only have the hypomanic episodes, but also have the major depressive episodes. 
Now I did cover major depressive disorder and its uh, diagnostic features in this video if you missed that, so check that out because you will have to meet the criteria for that for both bipolar one and bipolar two. Now, though hypomania is considered less severe than mania, Bipolar 2 can still be very debilitating because when a person with bipolar 2 goes into their depressive episodes, they are just as high of a risk for having suicidal ideation and acting on those suicidal thoughts. And they also have an increased rate of suicide. Actually one in three patients with bipolar 2 disorder will attempt suicide. So bipolar two disorder is not by any means less severe than bipolar one, though the hypomania may be less severe. The disorder itself can cause very debilitating symptoms, specifically when that person is in a depressive episode. Then we have the third type of bipolar disorder, which is cyclothymia. Now cyclothymia is having some hypomanic symptoms and depressive symptoms or depressive type episodes that don't meet the criteria for a major depressive episode or a full hypomanic episode. And so it's like this mix of the two. And these symptoms are with the person for a long period of time of at least two years. These patients are typically seen as temperamental, moody, unpredictable, inconsistent, and unreliable. Now, a lot of times people will get cyclothymia confused with rapid cycling. Rapid cycling in bipolar is different than cyclothymia. Rapid cycling is when you're going from hypomanic to manic if you're bipolar one and depression, and you're having these different episodes four or more times in a year. So that is what's considered rapid cycling, when someone's going in and out of manic, hypomanic, or depressive episodes, um, at least four of those within a year would be considered rapid cycling. Cyclothymia is just having some hypomanic symptoms present with depressive symptoms and going through both depressive and hypomanic type symptoms, but these symptoms are not enough to meet the criteria for hypomanic episode or major depressive episode. So now let's talk about some causes and factors of bipolar disorder. One of the main factors in bipolar disorder is genetics. Now this doesn't mean that just because you have a parent or someone in your family who has bipolar that you'll automatically have bipolar, but you are going to be at an increased risk for bipolar. In fact, the genetic factor is considered 80% of the causative factor in bipolar disorder. So it is a very strong factor of bipolar. Also, there are things in your environment that can put you at an increased risk for bipolar. So if you have a family member that has bipolar, so you may have the genetic variant for bipolar or genetic propensity for bipolar disorder. If you also have environmental factors like poor diet, early childhood trauma, poor sleeping habits, which can disrupt your circadian rhythm, unstable relationships and substance abuse, you will actually put your risk higher for bipolar disorder. There are also some biological factors that are noticed in bipolar disorder. And these biological factors are noted first with molecular imaging has demonstrated that there is a dysregulation in some neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, and glutamate. Mitochondrial dysfunction has also been noted, and this can lead to calcium dysregulation, oxidative stress, and the calcium signaling abnormalities can lead to hyperexcitability of neurons. Now, neuroimaging has shown a decrease in gray matter and white matter abnormalities in patients with bipolar disorder. Functional imaging has demonstrated an increased amygdala response and sensitivity and a decreased activity of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And this leads to an emotional and cognitive imbalance. And so now what are the treatment options for bipolar disorder? Well, there are three main types of treatment options, lifestyle modifications, therapy, 
and medications. So with lifestyle modifications, these are things like diet. Having an anti-inflammatory diet can be very beneficial for patients with bipolar disorder. This can also include supplementing with things like omega-3 fatty acids, as taking omega-3 fatty acids has been shown to reduce symptoms of bipolar. And an anti-inflammatory diet would include eating foods high in omega-3 fatty acids and getting rid of processed foods and refined sugars. Another lifestyle modification that's very beneficial is exercise. As I discussed in this video on how exercise treats depression, it can actually help to treat bipolar disorder or at least get a person who's in a bipolar depression out of that depression by all of the means that I've spoken about in that video, such as increasing brain-derived neurotropic factor, which increases neuroplasticity, decreasing inflammation, and decreasing the stress hormone cortisol. All of those benefits would be beneficial for someone with bipolar disorder. Another lifestyle change that's very important for patients with bipolar disorder is proper sleep hygiene. Disrupted circadian rhythm is shown to be a risk factor for bipolar disorder. And so if a patient with bipolar disorder can get into a routine of sleep and have a good sleep hygiene, which I discuss in this video, that will also help to improve the treatment of bipolar and keep the person from fluctuating into these different mood states. The second type of treatment option is therapy. So with therapy, there are a couple of different types of therapies that are found to be very beneficial with bipolar, and that's interpersonal therapy to work on relationships, social rhythm therapy, which establishes a routine in your life, as well as incorporating sleep hygiene techniques, and cognitive behavior therapy. Now, there are other therapies used to treat bipolar, but these are the top three that I would recommend. So with medications, there are three main types of medications used to treat bipolar. And many of you have asked about Lamictal or Lamotrigin, which is a mood stabilizer or anti-convulsant drug. And I'll be talking specifically about that medication in the next video. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss out on that video. Other medications include antipsychotics. And some of you asked about some of these medications, such as Olanzapine and Risperdal. And those videos will also be coming your way so again subscribe also antidepressants can be used but antidepressants must be used with caution because antidepressants can switch a person with bipolar into a manic episode so if you're going to use an antidepressant as a treatment for your bipolar disorder you always want to make sure that you're using either a mood stabilizer or an antipsychotic to help balance it out so that you don't switch into a manic episode so there you have it that's my overview of bipolar disorder do you have anything to add to that list Go ahead and drop it down in the comment section below. We learn from sharing each other's experiences. Also, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel because that really helps us get this information out to others who may find it just as useful as you did. And as always, I thank you for watching. I wish you well on your mental health care journey and I'll look forward to seeing you next week.